Hey everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to the TPM Wolf Boot webinar presented by David Garski, engineer at Wolf SSL. My name is Nandita and I will be moderating this webinar. All of the attendees will be in listen only mode and there will be a Q&A time at the end of the presentation. So feel free to enter any questions in the Q&A box and they'll be addressed at the end of the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and made available via link following the presentation. And without further ado, I present David. Hello everyone, my name is David Garski and I'm a software engineer at Wolf SSL. I have been with Wolf for almost five years and I have been involved with several of the libraries we offer. So I'm gonna to talk today about Wolf Boot with TPM, Secure and Measure Boot. So quick, I'll go over uh, just a short introduction of a Wolf SSL uh, for any newcomers. So this company started back in 2004 and uh, our CEO, Larry, was at MySQL and they needed a clean room implementation of SSL. And so he hired our CTO, Todd, to write this. And originally it was in C++ and it was called Yazzle. And then in 2006, due demand, popular demand, we uh, wrote it again in C, called C Yazzle. And then in 2014, we did a name change uh, and now we're called Wolf SSL. So that's our company name and our, our I guess our primary product name as well. So currently have over a thousand OEM customers, 14 resale partners, and we secure over 2 billion connections uh, at any one point in time. So here are our products. We have Wolf SSL, which is our TLS client server library, which uses WolfCrypt. WolfCrypt is our crypt cryptographic engine. It has uh, C versions of all of the algorithms plus assembly speedups in many cases. It's FIPS 140-2 certified. It's also DA178 certified. And we offer an asynchronous version of it. Uh, so we also have Wolf MQTT. It's a lightweight MQTT client, an SSH server and client, a TPM 2.0 library, and a secure bootloader called Wolf Boot. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Of course, we have lots of other little wrappers and things like that. So all of our software is open source. We distribute it in, at UPLv2, and we also offer a commercial license. Uh, most, uh, all of these libraries can be found on our website or on GitHub. We also offer professional support from engineers like me, and we have consulting services for integration or new features. All right, so now I'm going to talk about Wolf Boot and just a little overview of the library. So this library was written in C for, you know, embedded use as bare metal. It has a very small footprint, so it can run on, uh, you know, compact devices. It doesn't use any malloc or free. It's all mem memory safe implementations. Uh, it has support for onboard external flash. It uses a very simple partitioning scheme. Uh, for handling updates and a, a small header that goes on the front to identify the partitions, which we'll go over more. We've abstracted all the how interface to make it easy to add new targets and we support quite a few targets right now already. And uh, the bootloader itself actually handles the swapping for updates when new updates come down and it's uh, fail safe. We also have key tools for key generation and signing. So we currently support these methods of uh, authentication using, well, it's basically a signature, right? Where you verify it, verify a hash. So we support ECC, RSA, and ED25519. And the integrity of the image can be done using SHA-2, 256, or SHA-334. So the header basically has some tags on the partition, which is a version, a hash of the, the entire image, plus some of the header, and a hash of the public key and a signature. There's a few other things in there too, like the types of those things. And, um, and it's just a real simple tag format. This is uh, the header sizes by default for each type of asymmetric signing algorithm. Uh, so for ECC and ED25519, it's 256 bytes, and for RSA, 2048, 512, etc. So the, the scheme is really f flexible and it's determined at build time. There's a partition reserve for the bootloader the primary boot application, another partition for the update, where you would put the over-the-air update into, and then there's a, a swap sector, which is basically your fail-safe sector, 
that keeps track of uh, the currently the current sector that's being programmed and the state of it. And we support a reliable firmware update mechanism that's independent from the transport. So the actual swapping of the images is handled in the bootloader, not in the application. The application is responsible for uh, actually downloading it and putting it into the update partition. We also support a fallback. So in a scenario where the update has occurred and it didn't boot properly, uh, we'll fall back to the last known configuration, the, the last update. Let's see, so we have current how which hardware target support for a long list of STM32 platforms, the NXP, Kinetis, and LPC. Um, there's, there's, you can read these <laughs> long list, and it's pretty easy to expand, and we're expanding them all the time. So, Let's see, um, so hardware cryptography support. So this is offloading of operations to hardware crypto. So anything that WolfCrypt can already leverage, WolfBoot leverages as well. Uh, but in this case, uh, I just put together a few that. You know, so it's TPM 2.0, STM, and STM has SHA-256 acceleration for all those. And for example, they, they have a WB55 that has ECC acceleration, you know, and there's lots of different options here. All right, so now I'm gonna give a quick overview of Wolf TPM. So uh, also all written in C, uh, it's just a, a clean room implementation. Uh, it's designed for embedded use. It has no external dependencies. So like most TPM stacks, there's several layers deep and lots of code. In this case, it's meant to be very compact and directly talk to the hardware, right? So um, there's no memory allocations as well. Everything is stack-based and it exposes the, the lowest level APIs that the, 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 the specification defines from the TCG. Uh, so those are the TPM2 native APIs. And then we've added simplified wrappers to to help with like normal, like uh, I would say the most common use cases. So in a bare metal embedded, embedded environment, you would typically just define a, your own custom IO callback for the hardware interface to, to spy. Um, and then internally we have our own transport interface, the TIS layer uh, that handles the, the communication over spy. And on Linux, you have a couple options you can you can either use our internal TIS and access, you know, dev spy dev, uh, or you can use the Linux native dev TPM zero. So we support both of those. And in the later case there with dev TPM zero, it allows you to use it concurrently with the, uh, the TPM two tools and the things built in with Linux. So right now Wolf TPM has HAL examples for, for these platforms, the Raspberry Pi, STM32, Atmel, ASF, Xilinx, Zinc, Zinc, MP, and uh, we have Bearbox in there as well. And then we've tested Wolf TPM with the following TPM 2.0 modules. And technically, it would be compatible with any because of the specification, um, but we've tested against all five of these. Um, and I have some more information about each of these coming up here. So we also include examples for the native APIs, the wrappers, EKCS7, certificate, you know, CSR certificate signing requests, TLS, client server, benchmarking. We have a new one for doing a assigned timestamp for attestation and uh, PCR, which is the platform configuration registers used for measured boot. So I'm gonna give a quick background on TPM 2.0. Some of this I've presented before, so I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly. Uh, so a TPM module is a trusted platform module. It includes key generation and storage capabilities. And it was developed by the TCG back in November 99. Um, and it was had members such as Intel and Microsoft. So all of our efforts are around the TPM 2.0 specification, the latest one. Um, that was released back in 2013. But you can see some of the history there. So the most common uses of TPMs are in PCs, and, and I'll go into that a little more, but we are seeing a trend for using these in embedded IoT devices. Uh, thus, that's why we wrote Wolf TPM. So it, at a high level, there's three hierarchies, platform owner and endorsement. Each hierarchy has a generated seed and policy associated with it. 
Um, the seed is used along with a key template to generate any key um, that uses HMAC to drive the key. And there's also a null hierarchy for uh, ephemeral keys. So in a TPM, you can securely generate, store, and use keys. It also has non-volatile memory to store uh, data, and there's one-way counters. Uh, let's see, there's a, a true hardware random number generator. There's the platform configuration registers for major boot. It has some dic dictionary <laughs> attack prevention mechanisms. Uh, the TPM private key material is encrypted with a key that only the TPM knows, and previously created keys can be quickly reloaded. Uh, and most of these modules have some type of certification. They're common criteria RFIPs. Uh, an interesting feature about generating a key is it actually gives you back an encrypted blob, and then you have to load that. And you can really only have about, I think it's four or five keys loaded at a time. It's not a very large number, but it's meant that the, the, uh, the host actually store those encrypted blobs and then load them as needed. So TPM supports a large list of algorithms and vendors could add custom algorithms if they so desired. Most commonly would be RSA 2048 and ECC, the 256-bit, the NIST prime curve, and SHA-2. So I'm gonna dive in just a little bit into the modules and the differences between them. Uh, and this is the bottom of the, the table, it's hard to tell. And I highlighted some of the differences, but you can see a few characteristics about these three modules. I didn't have these characteristics for the New Baton or the Nation's Tech one. Um, but the ST one was the only one that had CBC encounter. Uh, it also has the common criteria NFIPS 140-2 level two. Uh, one thing to know is Infineon does not have very much onboard storage. The other two modules have quite a bit more. So I also did some benchmarking across the five modules which is which is kind of a fun effort. And I updated these numbers just, just before. Um, and I highlighted the, the highest values on each of these. And they, they all per, they're all pretty similar, to be honest. Um, we'll send out these slides afterwards so you can review these in more detail. And I need a pretty graph to go along with it. Yeah, that's about it there. Okay. So I also did the symmetric benchmarks for the RNG and the Shaw in the AES. And uh, you can kind of see that the, the throughput, these are kilobytes per second, is fairly slow on most of these modules. But you will notice the asymmetric performance is quite good. These are operations per second. So like, you know, being able to do 106, you know, RSA 2048 bit public operations a second is pretty cool. Same thing with the ECC verify, these are, these are great numbers, so. All right, skipping to this slide. And then I did another pretty graph, which you can all absorb later. All right, so now we're gonna dive into secure boot. So I, I pulled some of these requirements out of the IETF suite. It's a draft specification for defining a secure boot and some other things. Um, and we, we conform to, to this draft in, in Wolf Boot. Uh, but the gist of it is, you know, using a security algorithm to compute a fingerprint or a hash of the firmware image, and then generating the signature of that hash, um, including that. Also establishing a root of trust for verifying the signature. So in this case, Wolf Boot uses a public key as the root of trust. And it could, there could be multiple defined, but that public key is authorized to uh, accept firmware that's been signed by that, that private key. And then the other thing is to expose boot related data to the application, which basically means what's the status of the partitions and the versions and whether the failure or not, things like that. And then optionally you could offer attestation information such as major boot, things like that. So our, our root of trust uses a public key you would typically establish this at time of manufacturing, and it could be written to flash or, uh, I didn't mean OTA, I meant OTP, or external trusted device. Uh, there should be a mechanism to revoke and update this in the field, which is a process. Uh, so attestation, I just wanted to put a slide in here about this. So an example of it is a signed timestamp, which is basically a way that the 
the TPM specifically can sign uh, or attest to a piece of information that's specific to the TPM. So it can generate a, an attestation identity key, which is an AIK, it's a TPM term. And those AIKs are linked to a TPM private key that only TPM knows. And the source of these can be verified and cannot be spoofed. So signing uses a non, so the attestation is immune to like replay attacks or retransmission. And we've recently put a sign timestamp example into our Wolf TPM repository. So you can go check that out. So measured boot in the TPM sense is done using these platform configuration registers. Uh, these are using SHA-256. There is a SHA-1 variant in there, but that's considered deprecated. Typically there's 24 of these PCRs and usually the first eight are used by your system for measured boot. So PCRs are extendable, which means you can add hash data to it or you can read, and they're only reset upon a power loss or a reboot. No code should be executed until it's been measured and confirmed, right? So each boot phase basically extends the PCR and eventually when you get to the application, you can confirm that that's the right value you expect. And then you know that there hasn't been any tampering. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, I thought it would be fun to throw this slide in. So this is how our PCs use the PCRs. Uh, the PCs use this UEFI specification and you can see kind of the components in which PCs, PCRs are used during the boot phase. It's kind of interesting. All right, so I, I'm gonna deep dive a little technical here. I'm gonna show you using Wolf Boot, how simple it is. So I wanted to go over the directory layout real quick. So we have some configuration templates in this config examples directory. There's an extensive amount of documentation as markdown, in their markdown format in the docs directory here. And then all of the, the hardware abstraction, the support that we have is in this HAL, HAL directory. There's also some spy and UART stuff. Uh, and then this, there are sub modules that link to uh, WolfCrypt and WolfTPM. They're in the lib directory. And then source we have image.c is responsible for the cryptographic stuff. Uh, the main is actually in loader. The public facing APIs used by your application to let's say trigger an update, those are all in libwolfboot.c. And we also have uh, test applications. It's basically some of them will blink an LED or something to show you that it booted successfully. It's just a reference. And then we have a whole bunch of key tools that help with signing and key generation that you can use. So the first step in putting together and configuring your environment is creating a .config file that sits right in the Wolf boot root. And again, we have some examples that you can copy. So you can literally just copy one of the files in there to .config. Or you can use make config and it'll list out each option and you can choose and enter what you want. This is just an example for the STM32WB. And I'll talk about some of these parameters up next here. So some of the important uh, parameters that get set of the target, and this is a list of the targets we support. Also the signing algorithm, the asymmetric algorithm that we used for the signature and verification and the hash algorithm. If you want to enable Wolf TPM support, you just say Wolf TPM equals one. We also support a, a, very, uh, a very fast uh, asymmetric version of our math. It's called SP or single precision. And we have C versions of it. We also have assembly versions. Um, and I'll show you the difference in code size and performance. It's quite drastic. Uh, you can turn off the assembly for the SP math using the noasm. The Vitor is just the vector interrupt table relocation. It should usually be set to one, only some platforms won't. And then we actually support updating the bootloader itself if it's enabled at build time. And then this would be the version for the bootloader. So the bootloader update is not power fail safe, but the other updates with partition swapping are. So these are the important parameters you set. So one is the flash sector size. Uh, the partition size is basically the size of your application, and this, this reflects to your boot partition and your update partition. So both of those would be this size. And we also support using external flash for the update partition. Uh, and I didn't include that option, but it's spy underscore flash equals one. And then there's an external flash option too. You can see the documentation, but the, this doesn't have to be on chip for the update. It could be external. 
And then this swap address is where we have a flash sector size for doing the, the uh, power fail safe update. So this is just a, just a quick, imagine this is your console and you're cloning the repository. Uh, you first need to up initialize and update the submodules. And then we've recently added C versions of the key tools. So you can say make key tools and it'll build those. There's also, uh, by default, I'll use the Python versions, um, but you have to have the WolfCrypt Pi installed. And so it's a little, little difficult on some platforms like Windows, but on Linux, it's pretty easy. And there are instructions in our readme. So then you would take a configuration and you would copy it and you would do a make. And what we generate is a wolf boot elf and bin. So that would sit in your boot partition, the application code that sits just after that. And then we ultimately give you a factory bin. So that is a, com a combined image of, of the bootloader and the application, which includes a sign header. If you don't have a key, we'll actually generate one. Uh, yeah, and then sign it. So now I'm going to talk about key generation. So we have this key tool, key gen, and you can specify the asymmetric algorithm. And then you need to specify the one of these files for where the public key information goes. Because right now, the public key gets embedded into the bootloader. That's the root of trust. Um, but you could easily extend that. So um, currently, keys are expected to be, the private keys are expected to be here. Uh, that's if you're going to use these keys. You can al we also support an external key source like an HSM. Uh, and then public keys are expected to be as C files there. So this is the signing tool. Um, you specify the algorithms and then the image you want to sign as well as the key and version. So this one, as you would do updates, you would increment that value to two, three. And Wolfboot by default does not allow downgrades. So if somebody tried to use an install an older version, let's say that would not be allowed, except in the fail safe case. <laughs> Let me clarify. So um, if you wanted to output just the hash to be used external, you know, with an external HSM, you can say SHA only, and then you could supply the signature using manual sign. We cover all this in the documentation, but it's nice that we support use of an external key. So this is basically what your update flow would look like. So the application firmware uh, is responsible for downloading this, it could be over the air, and placing it into the update partition. And we have APIs available to tell you uh, where that is and stuff, uh, what the status is. And then you would call wolfboot update trigger and you would reboot. So then when wolfboot comes up, it'll see that the status says there's an update pending, it does all the signature checks, the hash checks, and then it will actually perform a swap of those partitions itself. And there are a few platforms that actually do uh, hardware-based swapping, and we support that. I think it's NXP has one of those, and maybe another one. Um, let's see. And then, so after Wolfboot's done with the swap, the application will boot, and the application needs to call Wolfboot success. So that marks that the, the boot and the update finished successfully. If that success is not called and another reboot is detected, we will roll back. We will roll back to the previous version. Let's see, so this is just kind of a visual about how we do the partitioning. And you can see you have your bootloader, your boot application, your update, and then the reserve sector for the swapping information. We actually use a few bits to can keep track of the current status and the, um, oh yeah, that's right. We use a few bits right at the end of the last update sector to track that, not in the swap partition. And then to enable Wolf Boot, Wolf TPM support, you would add this flag, and then um, you have to make sure you have a spy interface defined. We currently support the STM32 and R52 and Zinc for HAL interfaces to the spy, external spy support. Um, and then at that point, all verification of the signature will be done on the TPM. And you can optionally offload the SHA-256 hash as well if you wanted, um, that is very slow but it, we can, it, does, it is supported. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you some interesting comparisons between performance on a few different platforms. So I, I gathered these numbers just a few days ago. Um, so what we're talking about here is the asymmetric algorithm that was used for signing. And so this is the, the code size. So let's say on this target, STM32F4 running at 168 megahertz, had 25519, it was 10K, then 10,712 bytes, and it took 649 milliseconds to boot. So this is our C version. Let me see if I can get rid of this. Yeah. 
So this is our C only version of the single precision math. You can see the code size and the time it took to do the verification. Our assembly version of the single precision uh, you, for, that's optimized for Cortex M only took 36 milliseconds. But you see the code size is a little larger. We're talking 20K. And then for RSA 2048 with our single precision and assembly, it only took 17 milliseconds on this platform. And it was 11, 11K basically. So with the TPM, it took 182 milliseconds and the size was about 11K as well. And that was with an Infineon TPM. And uh, the RSA 2040, I didn't get the duration, uh, but I did get the code size. And then this one is a WB55, which also has a hardware-based PKA, PKA, which is ECC acceleration. So that one actually hit, was very small, 8.7K, 8, 8 and then it, was, it took 335 milliseconds to do the boot. So that's the time from um, the reset pin, uh, lifting and then all the way through to the application turning on the LED. And you can see the different platforms and how they compare in size and performance. Uh, one thing I did include in here is memory use, but uh, our bootloader only uses stack memory and it's very low. So, so this platform here is a K82. And this one also has a uh, ECC acceleration in their LT LTC engine. I don't know why it says LTE. It's LC LTC. Um, that one only took 29 milliseconds, and but the code size was th almost 33k. Uh, and then the last one is an, an NRF 52 at 64 megahertz. And this one you can see uh, each of the code sizes and times. Anyway, this is great information. So you can take it and process it later when we send out the slides. All right, so. I took 28 minutes and <laughs> said I have 30. So we have two minutes for questions. No, we'll stay on as long as you need. Uh, I'd love to hear some questions, so. It looks like I can actually pull up the questions. I guess I have the list of questions, okay. All right, so somebody asked what's the expected binary size of old TPM for a 32-bit ARM on a bare metal. The closest I could give you is the, uh, the one including Wolf Boot, which is right here. But this includes all the Wolf Boot code as well. Sorry, it's, yeah, these two. Um, I believe the code size of Wolf TPM alone, depending on the functionality you want to include, is as little as 4K, 5K, somewhere in there. Uh, what's the value range for the application version number? So currently it is a single unsigned 32-bit integer. So you can, is, there's not a minor major version as I understand it. Let's see. <laughs> So do you handle revocation of the root key? Yeah, so the way we currently handle that is through an update of the bootloader itself. And so you would sign with the old key and include a bootloader that has the new key and you would send down that update for the bootloader. Again, the bootloader update is not power fail safe uh, and hopefully doesn't have to be done that often, um, but that is the process for it currently. So this was a question, sorry, I may not have asked the question. So the question here is, is the TIS layer, which is the transport interface specification layer, a secure channel between the SOC and the TPM? So it's not in the TIS layer exactly, it's a layer above that, but uh, TPM 2.0 does support parameter encryption and it can use either an XOR or an AES-CFB of the first parameter in a, a TPM command. Um, that is something we're about, 50% through implementing in that feature will be available at some point soon, um, which it is very handy. Ah, this is a good question. Does Wolf Boot support updates that are encrypted on external flash? 
So the, the answer right now is no, but it is currently in progress. It is something we are working on adding. Uh, so it should be done the next month. So um, the question is, are all TPM modules tested external to the processor or were there some FPGAs tested as well? So all of this testing was done using just uh, those modules we listed, not FPGAs. So they were all external to the processor. Um, and all of these modules that we tested here were all over a SPI bus. Yeah, so all these modules. Uh, so there's a question, what OS is supported on the Raspberry Pi 3? And to answer that, all the things we're talking about here are bare metal. So um, th it is not OS specific. So you can run any OS if you want. That, that is, uh, and basically well, on the Raspberry Pi 3, we support loading and then jumping to an address, right? And, and so it's agnostic. So the question, there's another question, is Wolfboot a separate product license from Wolfgrip? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, Wolfboot license will include Wolfgrip. Um, they are, it is possible to license them separately. Let's see if I can break this down. There's three questions here. All right, so on the Wolf Boot part, you mentioned private keys also being on the device. Where are they actually stored and how are they protected? So Wolf Boot only stores the public key material. Uh, the, the private key material, this is used for the signing of the firmware image, is maintained at your manufacturing facility or development facility that generates firmware and it could potentially be in an HSM or something protected. Question two is swapping during upgrade. A single sector is used for swapping. I believe that even the IETF SUIT, the sweet pro draft, proposed to use at different parts of the flash to avoid wear on a single sector. <laughs> That's great feedback and we'll take that into consideration. That, that, is, that is very true because these flash parts have, you know, only a certain number of cycles on that, that sector that's used for swapping. Uh, Okay. And then what does it take to port Wolf Boot to a new and currently unsupported device? So it usually takes us a day or two uh, and it, there, everything has been narrowed down to just a few HAL APIs. So if you go into docs, uh, HAL.md, it describes those APIs. Um, and all the, the HAL support that's in there, well, at least most of it is written for bare metal without any external dependencies. This is a very, very Xilinx specific question. Does Wolf Boot start before ATF? And if so, does it launch BL one directly? Uh, yeah, so um, Wolf Boot starts after ATF. Uh, the Xilinx boot process has a bunch of things it does. Um, and the, the, the BL, I think you mean the ex exception level, EL1, it, it, it is corrected. Exception levels drop to EL1 by the time Wolf Boot comes along. Share the TPM. Okay, so this question is, you mentioned the applications can share the TPM when using dev TPM zero. How do they share it unless there is a resource manager as disk broker? So I believe that the, the dev TPM zero interface actually has some protection around who has the device open, uh, I believe. Uh, I might need some help on that, but in my experience, I've been able to run with sudo uh, any of my, my Wolf TPM examples, and then also run with sudo the dev TPM tools, not con maybe not concurrently but definitely separately. So this, this question is, can Wolf Boot run in a partition with hardware vir virtualization? And the answer is yes. I haven't done it, but it's definitely, definitely possible. 
What about the scope of common criteria and FIP certification for Wolf Boot? Is it only with Wolf TPM support? So that's a great question. Very good question. So Wolf, Wolf Crypt actually has FIPS 140-2. And if you're using Wolf Crypt, then you would also have FIPS certification. The, the FIPS 140-2 is around the crypto software module, um, the boundary is, so you would automatically inherit that if you were using Wolf Crypt FIPS. Um, the other part of that question is um, about common criteria, which, oh yeah, no, also, that's right. Um, so a lot of these modules, these TPM modules do support common criteria. We thus far haven't pursued common criteria certification. Uh, the FIPS 140-2 level one has been sufficient. Um, and I was also thinking of uh, that we are pursuing DO 178 with Wolf Boot. We've already begun that work. So that the A178 certification is for uh, like aircraft and mission critical systems. So this question is, are the certificates X509 or is it pri 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 proprietary? The answer is neither. Uh, all of the, the validation for this is based on keys and signing of asymmetric keys. So there's no certificate involved. It's using an asymmetric key with a public and private part. And only the public part is required to do the verification. And the important part is that that is rooted in a place we trust. So this question is, can I use a different key to verify boot modules at runtime and a different key to verify the update package. Um, so we do support two public keys being embedded into the bootloader, so conceivably that's possible. I have not tried that. Uh, I think it would be very easy to add support for that. So feel free to reach out to support at wolfssl.com. You can talk more about that, or fax at wolfssl.com. Uh, so this question is, will this work with VXWorks Wind River if the hardware is locked down RTOS pack PLC, i.e. not a real traditional host? I believe the answer is yes, because we're agnostic to the OS, <laughs> but I'm not clear on some of those terms, so we'll have to defer that one. So that is all the questions I have. Oh, there was one more about uh, ESP32. So is there ESP32 support on your roadmap or does expressive IDF in, uh, reduce the relevance of the, the work? Um, so WolfCrypt does support ESP32. So even though I didn't list it, it is a supported platform because you could leverage that uh, through WolfCrypt. Uh, it would just be a matter of getting the build settings correct for that. Okay, so Nanditha, is there any other questions you have uh, from the panelists? Yeah, so it looks like there are three more questions from the panelists. Um, for the panelists, can you discuss attestations and what APIs are available? And then, so what verifies bootloader? And then also, someone wants to go through the boot process on RPI. Uh, so you wanted to describe attestation. So it's a process of verifying the, uh, this slide is, uh, yeah. uh, is it possible you can send me the question on Skype or something? Yeah. While she's doing that, there was another question, how the root of trust is extended from the TPM to the SOC initial boot, SOC bootloader, SOC OS, et cetera. Um, so that's what Measured Boot does, right? Um, in our case, Wolf Boot, we're really early in the boot process. And so uh, it's just a matter of calling the PCR with a hash of the application or even the bootloader. Um, and then it's the later stages that are responsible for reading those and checking those. So what APIs are available? Yeah. So Right now, our attestation just uses the TPM2 native APIs. We're in the process of adding uh, wrappers to make that process easier uh, because the, the process of doing attestation requires having uh, an endorsement key and a storage key. 
and some policies and an authenticated session. There's a lot of things. So we will be adding wrappers in the next, probably by the end of the week, um, that simplify that process. And it takes a lot of the work we did in the, uh, the sign timestamp example and makes those easier to use. So the other question is, could you go through the boot process of the Raspberry Pi with both boot? Uh, I would love to. I'm not prepared to do that. I know we have the support and the documentation in there, and I haven't done it myself. Um, the author of this library is Daniela Blackmara, and he could address that. So if you want to know about that, just email fax at wolfacellacom, and we'll get you the details. I don't see any other questions. Anything else? Should we wrap it up? Yeah, it looks like there are no more questions. So Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, David, for hosting this webinar. It was very informative. And I'll be sending out emails to all the registrants with um, the recording of this webinar in case you wanted to refer to it, as well as the slide deck. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all.